Welcome to Connect Silicon Valley. We're so happy you joined us for Engage Virtual Edition. Engage hosts conversations with leaders about the intersection of faith and the marketplace. Today's featured guest is Kirk Perry, President and CEO, Information Resources Incorporated. He's a seasoned consumer products and brand strategist with over 30 years of consumer packaged goods and technology experience at Procter & Gamble and Google. He is married and has four children. Our host today is Dave Che. Dave is the Executive Director of Connect Silicon Valley and Chief Executive Advisor at AI Blockchain. A former lead pastor and CEO of a nonprofit, Dave pastored a church that grew from 13 people meeting in his living room to 750 members in Sunnyvale, California. He's married and has three children. You say in um, Skip Vaccarella's book that um, that the theme of your life was that, that people reached down and picked you up, uh, even though there was a cost um, and no benefit to them whatsoever. And uh, they saw something in you and that you didn't see in yourself. Um, was there a person in particular that was that person that kind of reached out to you that made a significant difference in your life as you were a kid struggling through the economics of life and, and just kind of trying to make it? Was there somebody in particular that reached out to you that that made that kind of impact? Yeah, and I, I had I had several people uh, in my life. I, I call them my angels, literally uh, multiple people. But one in particular, when I was young, really did change the trajectory of my life. And his name was Larry Jordan, and he was my little league baseball coach. And at the time, we were living in our trailer in the trailer park, and my mom and dad both worked at Ford on the assembly line afternoons. And that's the thing about you know being economically disadvantaged is parents have to make brutal choices. And so, you know, we were, I was 10, my brother was eight, my sister was seven. My parents would leave for work in the afternoon, you know, right either before we got home from school, or right when we got home from school, they would get home till 1 a.m. So we were at home. I mean, imagine having to make that excruciating choice. I mean, we don't let our kid, you know, when our kids were growing up and they were younger, wouldn't let them out of our eye shot, our eyesight, you know, riding their bike, let alone be at home for hours doing their own laundry and making dinner. I mean, who, who would, you know, who would make that choice if they didn't have to, but so it, I you tried out for baseball and uh, got picked up by this, this team in Cincinnati and showed up for my first practice. And here's this 20 late 20 year old guy named Larry mm -hmm. didn't have kids at the time, newly married, but he loved baseball. And he loved kids. And my first practice, I showed up with a, uh, you guys remember this, I might be aging myself, but at like Kmart, they used to sell these wiffle ball bat sets. And in this wiffle ball bat set, you'd have these plastic gloves. And that's, that was my glove. Mm -hmm. And so after practice, he pulled me aside and said, Kirk, Hey, we love having you on the team, but we're going to need you to have real baseball gloves. So that ball, that ball is going to rip through that. And if it gets hit hard enough, it's going to bust your teeth out or even worse than that. Mm -hmm. So I remember I went home that night and I left my mom a note because they weren't home and said, Hey mom, I need a baseball glove. And my coach said I need to have one for practice on Thursday and this Tuesday. So in the morning, you know, as I was getting ready, she came out and said, Hey, you know, I got your note, but you can't really afford a baseball glove right now. Of course, you know, I'm 10 years old. So I'm, you know, not listening to why we can't do it, which was very legitimate and good reason because we didn't have any money. But I remember I got home from school that day and lo and behold, in my bedroom on my pillow was a baseball glove. Mm. And I remember like, oh my God, this is such a great thing. And so that night I went to bed and I literally had the glove in my bed because, you know, you had, that day you start to put a baseball in it with some oil and that's right. That's tie right. it and put it under your pillow yeah, or under your mattress and just break it in. <laughs> and uh, I remember I was awoken to my parents arguing at one in the morning. Mm. And I remember my dad saying, are you kidding me? Why did you buy him a baseball? Because I left her a note thanking her. It's like, why did you buy him a baseball glove? We can't even make ends meet. We can't even get through the month. Why are you buying him a glove? And by the way, like, you know, as I'm an adult now, I, I don't, I, they were both saying the right things for the right reasons. My dad wanted to protect the family and have money. And my mom wanted to, you know, make sure I had the right equipment for the sport that I was trying to succeed in. So they're both doing it for the right reasons. And I remember crying myself to sleep that night. And the next day I went to practice and I brought my plastic glove because I didn't want to, you know, my mom not to be able to return that glove. And so coach Jordan pulls me aside after practice. And he said, hey, Kirk, hey, talk, thought we talked about having a glove and, you know, we're going to need to have you to have that glove. And I told him the story. And I remember he looked at me and he said, listen, 
we're going to make sure you have that glove. Whether your parents can afford it or not, I'll buy you that glove. And I'll tell you, that guy in that moment showed me, you know, he didn't have a kid on the team, but he had a heart for the kid on the team. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so, like I said, someone who at great cost to themselves would know, you know, he didn't have to do that for me. Mm-hmm. By the way, my mom and dad, my mom let me keep that glove and he didn't have to do it for, for my whole life or for, for my adult life, Mr. Jordan was involved in my life. And I remember I was getting ready to move to California and he had actually, when we moved back from Asia, we started seeing him and spending more time and he got to know my kids. When I left for California, he said to me, one, don't ever forget where you came from. Never forget that. And two, if something happens to me, I want you to you know, give my eulogy. And I said, Oh, Mr. Jordan, you know, that's, you know, I'm not going to have to give you a eulogy. I'm going to be back one day. And less than a year after I left, he had a heart attack, massive heart attack and died. And I gave his eulogy. Mm-hmm. It was fascinating is Larry was a, was a union electrician. There were 2,500 people at his funeral. Wow. Because wow. he was a guy who just cared for people. It doesn't yeah. matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you live. It matters how you treat people and how you impact their lives. And I, Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he talks about the fact that the, the ladder of power reaches up, but the ladder of grace reaches down. Mm. You know, Larry had the ladder of grace, and he reached down to me. This mm. kid who had nothing and nothing, you know, like he just saw potential in me. I didn't see him myself. And so he was that person. In fact, there, I coached youth sports for over 20 years. I coached 36 different teams in three different countries, four different, five different sports. And I did it. In a large part because of Larry did it what he did for me. And I just wanted to pay that forward. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, God had put him in my life for a reason. And I wanted to give a little bit of that back. Yeah. Him. Yeah. It seems like even though at the time you you weren't really a person of faith, but here was seemingly God reaching out to you through a human being that that you respected, you know. Yeah. It was he wasn't a real old guy. He was a young fella, in fact. But it's so nice that as you you know, share about your background, how it seems like in different parts of your life, you've had, you've had almost God, you know, maybe the angels of God kind of reach out to you to kind of point you in a certain direction. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about all these people that, that were influential in your life, you had also mentioned this experience overseas, um, especially in Asia. And I thought it was interesting, you know, the, the, the diverse experience that you got out there. So would you mind sharing a little bit about your uh, cultural experience out, out in uh, Korea and Japan. Yeah. You know, I, uh, when, when uh, the company first came to me and talked about moving to Korea, this was a kid who, when I graduated from college, had never been east of New York City and never been west of Chicago, Illinois. I was as Midwest milk toast as you could possibly be. <laughs> and when they talked to me about going to South Korea, two things came into my mind. One was, uh, CNN headline news and nothing good ever happens on CNN headline news. Um, and then the second thing is mash the sitcom mash. I'm dating myself, but those are the two things I knew about South Korea. And, and so when the company said, do you want to go? You know, I was like, look, I know I need to be a global citizen. If I'm going to succeed in this company, we're going to have to do something different. And we had an opportunity to go to Brussels, Belgium, stay in Cincinnati or go to Korea. And we chose Korea. And it was such a life altering experience. And, and if I summarized it quickly in both Korea and Japan, you know, one of the things I learned um, and we learned as a family is people would say to me, hey, what was better, Korea or Japan? It, you know, or is the U.S. better than Korea and Japan? And I would say it's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the beauties of living abroad is you realize like we are way, way, way more alike than we are different. We all have common dreams. We want, you know, we want to succeed in life. We want our kids to be, you know, grow up better than we did. We want to be healthy. We want to be safe. You know, all of those universal human attributes were very, very comparable. And, and so I, you know, when I think about that, not better, not worse, not different all the time, because we live in such a polarized world now, world now, I think if people had to live abroad for some period of time, I bet you we'd have far fewer wars and antagonism toward folks mm-hmm. in other countries. The other the other thing I learned was to be comfortable, or be comfortable being uncomfortable. I can tell you, you know, I, I did not have a second language skill when I moved over there. And, you know, the sights, the sounds, the smells, everything, the culture was so different. I was uncomfortable all the time. But you know what? It's in discomfort that you grow. And I just grew so much in so many ways because 
I was constantly, you know, it's that expression of, you know, if a diamond, if a piece of coal has no pressure, it's a piece of coal. But if a piece of coal has pressure, it turns into a diamond. And I, and I feel like in a lot of ways as human beings, we try to find comfort. And I, quoting Philip Yancey again in his book, he talks about the fact that God never promises us comfort. No, God cares more about our character than he does our comfort. Mm. And I think about that a lot. And I, we, we went to Korea, um, you know, looking back to your point earlier, Dave, I mean, God has always been in my life. I just didn't have the frequency tuned in where I was listening to him, mm -hmm. but he was there. He protected us. He gave us this experience, which again, you know, looking back literally changed us. I mean, we, our, our two oldest daughters grew up overseas for six years. They are citizens of the world. I, my third mm -hmm. child, my six foot, two inch, 200 pound, um, football player at the university of Cincinnati, the number three ranked university of Cincinnati Bearcats, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this kid, this kid was born in Japan and, you know, just to have the experience of being overseas and seeing the world through a different lens, they're just different kids. And so that was incredibly positive. And the other thing was from a professional standpoint, it fundamentally changed me as a leader. And one particular instance was probably the best coaching I've ever had. And it was Ironically, with a guy who started, he was a Korean national, went to Duke, started the same day I did. So he was day one with Procter & Gamble in mm -hmm. Korea when I started my expat journey there. And his name was Iksup Shin. And to this day, I still keep in touch with Iksup. And he, uh, so for the first 30 days, for 60 days, my wife and kids stayed back in the U.S. while I got acclimated and learned the culture and the brands and the new organization. And about 30 days in, I remember it was a Thursday night, about 10 o'clock, and he came into my office and he shut the door and he's like, you are killing us. <laughs> like, I was thinking in my head, like, I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? And I was thinking, did I say something? Did I, did, I, did I do something wrong? And he's like, look out there. Look at all these people out here. It's 10 o'clock on a Thursday. Why do you think they're here? And, you know, using the love language of sarcasm, I said, I don't know, probably working. And he said, no, in Korea, people don't leave until the boss does. And then I go into ugly American mode, which is, oh my gosh, how professionally immature is that? When you get your work done, you leave. What do you? And he cut me off and he said something, and I'm paraphrasing. This isn't exactly what he said, but over the years, I've kind of come to this, this phrase that he, he invited in me. And he said, Kirk, you can't expect us to leave 5,000 years of genetically encrypted code at the front door every day. You can't expect us to be American. Mm -hmm. We won't expect you to be a Korean. Don't expect us to be American. Why don't we meet in the middle and bring the best of both? Mm. And I remember it was like a light switch went off for me professionally. I'm like, oh, wow, what a great insight. So instead of talking more, I started talking less. Mm. Instead of telling more, I started asking more questions. Instead of just pushing my ideas through, I let others bring me their ideas. And I really learned in a place that, you know, like Korea and Japan and both, where I was, you know, not a part of the culture. I was not familiar with all of the nuance that goes along with that. And to have that experience, that growth experience, I think has made me a better human being. It's made me a better leader. It's made me a better husband, maybe a better father. And Ixup is a key reason for that. And he gave me yeah, some. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, so many uh, men uh, crave to learn empathy uh, of just what it, what it feels like, you know, to step in the shoes of someone else that's different from, from you and, and for you to, be overseas like that that's incredible to walk away with that kind of experience so does that mean that you've you've actually picked up a little korean can you actually speak a little korean <laughs> oh no one's had it so. <laughs> that's, hey, that's awesome. about the extent of my korean I, I i know a little bit more japanese than i do korean but my wife wow. is way better way better at korean than i am so so uh, ordering at a korean barbecue is not a problem for you no, it is a problem now. It's been too long. Yeah, I don't, I don't have, I, I don't have the skill now. <laughs> well, yeah. we'll go. We'll go. I'll order for you. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, um, you know, continuing with just uh, your your life. I mean, as I you know have read about your life and and and, and spoken to, you, um, it, it seems like the pivotal point uh, was when your daughter Carly was breathing in pain as a result of surgical adhesions after having her uh, kidney removed. Um, mm -hmm. You said, you know, what kind of God lets this happen to a child? Uh, and then your wife uh, said something that changed your life. Mm -hmm. Bring us back to that moment. You know, what did Jackie say to you that changed your life? Yeah. So give a little context. Um, you know, we had, uh, 
we were almost done with our assignment career. We were supposed to be moving to Japan anyway. And my wife had come back with the girls in the summer and we found out that Carly had kidney cancer. And it was such a like stop you in your tracks moment that it turned everything upside down. I had to go back and pack her stuff up and some stuff to Japan, bring some stuff back to the U S and was doing my Asian job from the U S which was interesting. Um, and then I, I remember I, I came home from work one day and this is after she had her kidney removed and part of her colon removed or no, her kidney removed. And, and so we we're having dinner and Carly six and our second daughter, Corinne was three. And I remember we're eating and all of a sudden Carly yells out, hits the floor, writhes in pain for like 10 seconds and gets up like nothing happened and then starts eating again. Mm. Like, hmm. 10 minutes go by, boom, same thing. Hits the floor, rise around in pain, gets back up. So we called our oncologist and he thought it was something to do with the surgery and said, if it doesn't get better in an hour, bring her down. So of course it didn't get better. We brought her to the hospital. So we check her in. It was a Monday night. And they put a tube down her nose into her belly. She couldn't even keep ice chips down. And so over the course of the next five days, every 10 minutes, she was hitting the morphine drip because she was in such pain. Um, my wife, who is the toughest woman on earth, like did not sleep. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how she survived. I would lay on the couch. I would definitely sleep, but she barely slept. And I remember on Saturday morning, I called our doctor and said, hey, you guys either figure this out today or we're taking her to Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo or Johns Hopkins, something, but we can't, can't live like this. Like you got to find out. So I remember a couple hours later, we'd gotten her an MRI and we had the curtain drawn around her bed and all of a sudden running down the hall, which is not unusual at a children's hospital, except they opened our curtain and said, could you talk to us out in the hallway? And, mm -hmm. Which wasn't good. So we went out in the hallway and I'll never forget it. We were standing around. There were probably five doctors there, my wife and I, and the doctor said, well, the good news is we think we know what's going on. We think that when we removed your kidney, there's a surgical adhesion that has, it's basically a scar that is blocking her colon or peristaltic wave. The thing that moves things through your colon is being blocked. That's where the pain's coming from. So we're going to have to go in, we're going to have to clip it out. But the problem is we think she has a perforated colon, which means that what's been inside of her colon is now leaked into her gut. We're going to have to cut her open. We're going to have to leave her open for two weeks. We're going to have to put a colostomy bag on her. I remember literally thinking to myself what you just said, which is there is no way there's a God. No, yeah. no God would let this happen to me. And just as context, at this point in my life, you know, I'm 33 years old. I would say I academically believed in God, but I had zero relationship. I went mm -hmm. to church one hour a week. In the other 167 hours, I was anything but faithful. And I wasn't a great dad. I wasn't a great husband. I was certainly not Christ centered. You know, I was working my butt off just to, you know, quote unquote, take care of my family, but really selfishly wanted to succeed. Um, and I, I remember, you know, we run, get her, they run her down the hall and we're down in the pre-op area and the anesthesiologist comes in. My wife and I are across from her bed and the anesthesiologist comes in and he puts a vial of morphine in her port. And I remember she grabs the anesthesiologist and pulls him down to her face and says, you've got to help me. You've got to help me. You've got to take this pain away. Mm. And he looked up at us and he said, you know, I can't give her anything else because it could kill her. And, and I remember looking over at my wife and I, and I'm not very emotional, but I just had tears streaming down my cheeks. And so, and so did she, and my mm. daughter, Carly reaches up. And this is like one of those moments that you'll never forget. And she looked right in my eyes. She said, daddy, daddy, please. You got to help me. You got to help me. You're the only one that can help me. Please, please take this pain away from me, please. And she was crying out to me. And I remember they, they run in and they grab the gurney and they wheel her off. It was a five and a half hour surgery. And we went in to this Saturday afternoon, empty operating waiting room at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, not a soul in there. And I was just, I had all of the life sucked out of me. I mean, it was, it was, I can't even describe what it felt like not being able to help your kid in that moment. Mm. So an hour and a half later, the doors swing open and here comes our surgeon literally like this with his gloves on his full guard mask, blood on him. And this is an hour and a half in. Mm. And, and he looked, he pulls his mask and he's like, Hey, great news, great news. You know, we opened her up and she did have an adhesion. We clipped off about 12 inches. We, we, resected her colon. We sewed her back up. There was no perforation. You'll be able to see her in an hour. No colostomy bag, no perforation. You'll mm. be able to see her in an hour. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, they went, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And remember when he left, we literally hit our knees. And in the Bible, it talks about, and Jesus wept. Mm. I don't think I really knew what that word meant until that moment. I wept. Mm. And I remember Jackie looked at me and mm. she kind of wiped the tears out away from my eyes. And she said, can you imagine how God felt when his son was hanging on that cross, screaming out, my God, my God, why mm. have you forsaken me? Mm. And he had the power to stop it, but he didn't because he loved us that much. Mm. She said, we would have given anything, our lives, to stop Carly's pain, but we couldn't. And I remember in that moment, you know, people talk about these things. It, it was it was like that proverbial lightning bolt for me. It was like this flashback sequence where I'm like, hey, all these moments in my life that I taught, that I think mm-hmm. about, that was God. That was God putting right. me in this direction. And, you know, and I talk about it as a transformation, not a perfection. I am far from perfect. I fall short every day. But what it mean to, what it means to me is I always tried to run away from God and ignore God, yeah. but I was orienting toward God and running toward God. And that to me was the differentiation in that moment for me is it became God became the center for the first time in my life. And it, it totally changed my trajectory. And yeah. so that that's what that moment, that's what my wife said that really, really like was my lightning bolt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like how you said that, that it wasn't like it made you perfect, but it turned your orientation toward God, going from more of a Kirk Perry centered life to more of a Christ centered life. So so what does that look like now? I mean, that's that's several years ago. So what does post seeing Christ that way life look like? Um, you know, how, how is it affecting your marriage, your your parenting, your work, your self understanding? So what is what is this? Um, you know, shift from being Kirk Perry centered to Christ centered uh, look like for you, for you today? Yeah, I have to caveat this because I'm sure my wife and kids will be watching this. <laughs> I, am, I am, I am, I'm far from perfect, Dave. Yeah. So, you know, what I think I would say is I'm far more intentional mm. about making sure that I'm remembering who I live for. Mm. And, and so what that shows up like in my marriage you know, I think of um, First Corinthians, of course, talking about love, chapter 13, you know, verse four and on where love is patient, love is kind. But actually, verse five talks about, you know, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Like that would have been a pretty good description of me prior to finding who God was in, in moments still uh, indicative of how I am. But, you know, it's it, it, one of the things it forced me to do is really think about like, wait a minute, my wife's on my team. Like she's on team Kirk. She's on team Jesus. Like she's not against me. She's for me. And so what, it, you know, I always had to win the argument. I always had to win the fight. And what it's, in, what it's forced me to do is stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, whether I'm wrong or right is irrelevant. Like I, you know, I, I think Skip Baccarelli used to say, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be married? And, <laughs> you know, and I, and I think about the fact that, you know, now instead of, trying to win something like I, I'll, I've learned how to apologize, learned how to mm-hmm. just say, you know what? I, I'm sorry. And I think the Bible is filled with flawed people who learn how to apologize. And so I think in my marriage, that's one of the things that, you know, my transformation has enabled is yeah. you know, yeah. not being so proud that I can't say I'm sorry. And I screwed up and I did wrong. And, you know, I want you to, you know, forgive me. And, and I sincerely mean that. And so Hopefully, my wife would say, and my kids would say that I that I jumped to apologize. I think, you know, from a parenting standpoint, Psalm 127, 127, 3, it talks about children are a gift from the Lord. Mm. They are a reward from him. And I, you know, when I grew up, I I did not feel like a gift from the Lord. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like honestly, like an indentured servant in some cases. And yeah. Never, yeah. never felt safe, never felt protected, never really felt like, man, you know, the unconditional love. And what Jesus and God tell us is like, my love is unconditional for you. I'm going to chase you no matter what, you know, I didn't feel that as a kid. And, you know, I vowed when I became a parent, like, man, I want to be different. I want to change the trajectory of my family. I want my kids to never, ever wonder if I love them or that it's conditioned on anything. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I tell them all the time is nothing you do will make me love you more. Nothing you do will make me love you less. And I think, that's God's promise to us. That's and so right. as I, you know, as yeah. I think about my kids, one of the things I've tried to be very intentional about is 
we all have read the book um, Love Languages and, you know, the five languages of love. And, you know, it's time, wor time uh, words of affirmation, touch, gifts, and service. And I always joke the sixth one is, is as I mentioned earlier, sarcasm for me. Um, <laughs> it's an excellent love language. I'm kidding, of course. But what I've tried to learn with my kids is each of them is different. My four kids, two, got two boys, two girls, and each of them has a different set of love languages. And I try to figure out what they are. I've tried to figure out what they are and leverage those. Like I said, I've coached them all in sports. We, we, when they got old enough, 10 or 11, I would take them on a trip, just they and I, you know, whether it was New York city or Hawaii or wherever they wanted, Washington, DC, they've all had a different trip and, and really have, and, and someone gave me the advice early on. They said, you're going to go through four epics as a parent. You're going to be, you're going to be a nurse because without you, they die. You're going to be a dictator because without you, they're going to stick that, that, that uh, screwdriver in the light socket. They're going to run in the street and play. Then you're going to have to be a coach but then you're gonna to have to be a friend and you've got to figure out how to transition in those four areas throughout their life and i would say like our first daughter carly we were a dictator way too long and i say we proverbially me um <laughs> a dictator way too long and not really transitioning into being a coach and so we try you know each of them i've tried to figure out differently and hopefully a little bit better every time and then i think from a work standpoint you know um in first corinthians 16 13 it says be on your guard, stand firm in the face, faith, be courageous, be strong. And, you know, from a work standpoint, I think if you'd have gone back to my high school days, you know, I would have been least likely to use you know, those euphemisms they used to give people in high school. Um, I would have been least likely to share my faith because I grew up in a house where if you talked about your faith, you were faith, you were considered a Bible thumper, a Bible beater. Mm -hmm. And so I never talked about my faith. So people would, be like, oh, that guy's never going to share anything because I would literally never, never talk about it openly. But now it's, it's the opposite. It isn't like I wear like a neon sign on my forehead that says, I love Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I try to role model how I think Jesus would be in a business leader. And mm -hmm. I want people to say, what's different about that guy? Why does he use the word blessed? And, and I'll give you one example. Um, I had a situation personally where I first moved here. Started working for Google, had a rough first year. It was not a good first year, if I'm honest. And several struggles in that first year at work and hadn't found a church family here. We left our family and friends behind. And, and then I find out that I had cancer. And in fact, I had stage four cancer um, in 2015. It was pretty shocking. Um, and one of those things like, God, are you kidding me? We followed you out here. And now I've got cancer. What the heck are you doing? Why am I, you know, woe is me. And I remember I had to tell my boss and, and I was going to have to get surgery and I was going to get treatment. And I, I remember they were like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd share this with your team, you know, make them nervous. And I said, eh, it's important to me. It's just it's how I roll. It's what I'm going to do. So I made a video, like a seven minute video. And basically I had, I had this quote above my, my desk. It's Charles Swindoll and it's called attitude. And the very end of it, it says life is 10% what happens to you, but 90% how you react to it. And so I started out my video talking about that, giving my team the update. And there was probably in my, at that time, six or 700 people in my organization globally. I hadn't been there that long. And I said, hey, here's what's going on with me. And I said, two things. One is if you could, if you could just deliver, that would take a lot of pressure off me. It would one less thing I have to worry about. I said, the second thing is if you're so inclined, I'd love for you to pray for me. And I mm -hmm. said, I know that works. I know it's powerful and I've seen it change situations. And so I'd love it if you wouldn't mind praying for me. So I sent that video out. I remember I came in the next morning and my assistant, I usually beat her in, but she beat me in that morning. And she's like, Hey, you're not going to believe this. You got like 400 emails that came in last night. Oh my goodness. She had put them in a filter. And I spent, I can't, I don't even, I'm embarrassed to say probably hours um, not working, but reading through every one of these, because the things that people shared with me wow. were incredible. Like there were people trying to lift me up and they were going through far worse than what I was dealing with. It was just another example to me of, mm -hmm. I, didn't have, like, I didn't have to have a neon sign on my forehead, right? I can share who God is through my actions and my words, and then people will pick up on that and respond back and resonate back. So I think those, you know, when I think about my, how my, my marriage has changed, how my relationship with my kids has changed, how I go about my work has fundamentally changed because Jesus is the center of it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it runs so countercultural to the kind of the world's view of great leaders, right? I mean, in the world's view, leadership, you lead with strength. 
right. with, with impenetrable, you know, hey, I'm, I'm put together, um, you know, I don't do anything wrong, we're going we're gonna to lead to strength. And just the fact that you shared your struggle of cancer and you got 400 emails, I mean, it's almost like, like, you know, the best leaders, I believe, lead with a limp. You know, they're open and honest and, and people find that so compelling, you know, yeah. and, and refreshing. So that, I think that's, that's very encouraging, Kirk. I think, Dave, you know, I would say real leaders are humble, authentic and vulnerable. And that, that's kind of countercultural because, you yeah. know, humble, authentic and vulnerable. But if you think about it, that's Jesus, you know, he, right. was, God, he was God in the flesh and he was humble, authentic and vulnerable. I mean, regardless of you know, crying out, oh my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? I mean, that that's God hanging on the cross, crying out, like, you know, that was vulnerable and, and many examples of that. So I think real leaders are able to do that. And I've learned from amazing leaders and particularly the leader of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That that last story just, just you know, kept reminding me of the difference between a leader who leads by example uh, as a Christ follower and, and a leader who maybe just wants to lead for the sake of leadership. Um, but yeah, uh, so I, I guess in, in some ways you answered this last question I was gonna ask you was, you know, what, what your faith looks like at work, but you basically answered by, by just living out sacrificially and vulnerably, um, you know, people wonder why you are the way you are. Did you want to add anything more to that? Because I, I think as a Christ follower, especially in, in the role that you have, I mean, you, ha you play such an influential role in the secular marketplace, and especially in the Bay Area, where e the mere mention of Christ, people want to drive you out of town. How were you able to navigate that as a, an executive at Google and, and now at IRI? How, what does your faith look like at work? I mean, I know you're not a, a Bible thumping guy, but what does that look like every day for you to, to live out your faith? Yeah, I think, you know, like that example I gave you, my my philosophy and how I share my faith at work is from the premise of, you know, who did God make me to be? Because I think my role in my career is being a missionary in the marketplace. Mm, yeah. And, you know, as as Jesus says, I, you know, I I didn't I didn't come for the religious, I didn't come for the well, I came for the sick. And, you know, and I, when I look at and, and what encourages me, who did Jesus pick to be his disciples? Didn't pick the Pharisees, didn't pick the Sadducees. He picked the marketplace guys, he picked the fishermen, mm -hmm. he picked, the, picked the tax collector who mm -hmm. was the scourge of the earth, right? I mean, he picked people who were in the marketplace. And I, I look at that and think, gosh, there, and God talks about work a ton in the Bible. Like he doesn't expect us to, once we become Christians, to like sit back and wait for the rapture to happen expects us to go off and be productive and, you know, to make sure people know who he is. And I think for me, it's, you know, do I, do I walk with integrity every day? Do, I mean, I think about the traits of our faith, you know, and, and I think what's interesting about sharing who we are, you know, I, I think my Christian faith is about what we stand for, not what we're against. I think mm -hmm. so many times people get turned off from our faith mm -hmm. of, you know, is it a political party? Is it, you know, is it, you got, Jesus was so specific on things when they said, what are the greatest commandments? He's like, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's right. Love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, don't judge people or you're going to be judged accordingly. I mean, he, that's right. pretty that's right. simple advice on how to be <laughs> the followers that he wants us to be. And I think for me, it's living it out. And it doesn't mean I'm not going to make mistakes at all. Like I, I falter, but I also want to own it um, and make sure people know like, wow, like, he just admitted he was wrong or what he changed his mind and he told us why, or, you know, he said this in a meeting and he was very, you know, like I, you know, make sure I check in on people and how they're doing and just things that I think that if Jesus were sitting in the CEO chair, he would do. Um, and, and again, if, and I've had so many times over the course of my career since, you know, my, my faith conversion where I've had people come up to me and say, Hey, I, are you a believer or, are you someone who believes in Jesus? And they start asking me questions. And I think that's sort of the seed planting. My job is not to, you know, is not to reap. My job is to plant those seeds and God on his time will bring people to him. And I think sometimes, you know, I used to think, Oh, like, you know, the scorecard of how many people came to faith because of me, like totally self-centered, absolutely not at all what God expects me or wants me to do. God wants me to be a great example so that, other great examples as well can influence people to one day they wake up. Like for me, I had several people 
who were seed planters and me along the way. And, and when I found God, it was because of them helping me stay on the tracks that eventually would get me to who he is. That's right. That's right. And, and it's, it's important to get those roles right. I mean, there's what God does and guess, guess what we do. I've heard it said like this, that God is the, we're the caregivers, but God is the cure giver. Mm -hmm. God is the one that ultimately transforms everything, but we can do our job, which is to care. So you, you're, mm -hmm. you're affirming that. Well, well, Kirk, thank you so much. This has been so encouraging. Um, thank you for sharing your life with us. It's not just some teaching you're throwing as I, my sense is that you were sharing your life with us. And you've really helped us to see that God speaks to us, particularly through trials. And God has sent people along the way, um, you know, Coach Larry and and people in your life just to reach out to you, kind of point to God. And eventually at 33, it, it took the tragedy of your six-year-old daughter to to help you to see, is like, my goodness, this God, there is a God who loves me and a God who cares. So thank you for communicating that so well. Um, so what I want to do now is just I want to be respectful of the time that we have and um, give, give people an opportunity to kind of ask you questions. I'm sure they have a few. And so if we could just stay on a little bit longer and have people kind of um, ask a few questions. Uh, so just want to give everybody an opportunity to, to share. You know, maybe you can share an observation or if you have a question that you'd like to, um, uh, to give to Kirk. Um, That'd be fantastic. I'm looking at the questions here. Um, lots of comments, um, but I, I, there's not a question there. Feel free, uh, you guys, to to ask a question. Uh, good comments here. You've got some saying Kirk is a great example of humility. Um, uh, somebody quoted a, a, a verse, Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. This is the excellence God is calling us to. Kirk is right in the center of this. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, yeah, here we go. I got a question coming. Here's the question, Kirk. What advice do you have for people like us who haven't yet publicized our faith in the workplace? Yeah, and you know, I, I, I don't think of it as an advertising campaign. You know, a lot of times people feel like, hey, if I've, if, I'm, if I've come to Christ, I should stand on the top of the break room table and let everyone know. And I don't think that's the case. I think it is in the small moments that we're able to share who we are and the faith that we have. You know, I, I have the good fortune of having a, a big platform where I can, you know, I can stand in front of, I mean, our company has 5,000 people and I get the opportunity to stand in front of 5,000 people and talk and, you know, and, and have the opportunity to, to share a little bit of who I am. And not everybody has that ability, but I think it's in the one-to-one -one interactions. I think that's how God changes, right? That's how God brings, you know, he started with 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now look at the number, if you think about the multiplier effect of 12 disciples in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and today, 3 billion, 3.5 billion people around the world follow him. And that's a pretty remarkable downline. And it starts one person at a time. And so I think for me, it's having a relationship. It's letting people know in those quiet moments, like, yeah, you know, well, how did you get through that? Or what did you do? Well, I have faith in the Lord. And th those are the moments that I found, like, because the other thing is, it's sort of like if, if I use the baseball analogy, you wouldn't go from little league to the major leagues. Um, you would have to go through, you play high school and then you go to college and you play single A, double A, triple A and major leagues, right? You work your way up. You wouldn't want to come right out of the gates and throw yourself into it. I think it's the ability to have those little moments where you can start pressure testing. This is how I talk about it. This is how I share it. This is how I learn from it. Because mm. I had times when people ask me questions because I always think like, oh, well, unless I'm a biblical scholar, I'm not going to share that I'm mm. faithful. Mm. And then I learned like, wait a minute, people are asking the same questions over and over. I need to understand like this specific question and then come back with a better answer or mm. let people know like, hey, I don't know, but you know what? Come to church with me and you know, I'm just, we'll mm. be talking about that this weekend. Those little moments add up to big moments that that bring people along. So I think it starts one on one. That's really good. That's really good. Um, we had a, another person ask, um, "What do you look for in mentorship?" Like I get, I guess for your mentors, when you look for a mentor, what do you look for? Yeah, um, I, I have a few mentors in my life. Um, one of them, Mac McQuiston. Mac is probably late seventies. I mean, Mac speaks. Um, you know truth and grace into my life mm. um, calls me out when I'm, um, you know, 
when I look for mentorship, I need people that tell me the truth, right? Mm. You know, the emperor is wearing no clothes sort of thing. Because when, when you, you know, when you're in a situation in a company where you're the leader of that company, the feedback is most time gratuitous. And, you know, no one wants, everybody's like, oh, I can't give real feedback. I'm going to just tell them the good things. And that's not really feedback, but, you know, Mac speaks truth and grace. Like when I need some grace, he gives it to me. But when I need the truth, he gives it to me as well. So when I, when I, when I have a mentor, I want them to speak truth and grace. Into yeah. me. I, I, it's very intentional. Mac and I get together at least once a month, but something's going on. I can call him at any time. He'll call me, but having somebody with wisdom. And by the mm-hmm. way, you can be somebody who's 15 and wisdom filled or someone who's 80 and wisdom filled. Wisdom to me is just the ability to see patterns and learn from them, good and bad. Mm-hmm. And I, I think sometimes people have it at a younger age and it doesn't, my hair's obviously white. So <laughs> some, would in, some would assume I have wisdom, but that really doesn't matter because I could be a 55 year old boy or a 15 year old man. And I think, you know, I, I, I want someone who has true wisdom and speaks truth and grace into me. That's right. That's right. Speak, speaking truth and love. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Yes, sir. Uh, here, here's a um, here's another one on the opposite side now Kirk your leadership is a form of discipleship in the marketplace tell us if you disciple others on a regular basis I do um, and what's interesting is how oh, some people may not like this but I, I have a group of guys uh, that I get together with regularly we, we get together on Monday nights and it's called beers and Bibles and the idea <laughs> behind this was to get guys together in an informal setting to share their stuff mm. and, and, and honest feedback. And, and by the way, they don't have to drink beer to be a part of this. It's just a euphemism for guys sitting around working through life struggles. And the first night I did this been over two years ago. And I borrowed the idea, by the way, from a friend of mine in Cincinnati. So it wasn't an original thought. It was somebody mm-hmm. else who had it, but I just, I, I did the West coast version, but the first night we did it, we had 13 guys. I was the only common thread. I had some people I worked with at Google. I had some people I coach football with, had some friends, in the community, but I was the only common link and most people didn't know each other. And so I thought, and tonight's going to be just a really, you know, tiny dip into this pool. Uh, and that first person up and I'm like, Hey, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. And the person comes out of the shoot and shared something like blow your hair off your head, sort of like, Oh, oh my gosh, major life challenge issues. And it, and every guy went around and everybody had junk that they mm-hmm. were dealing with. Mm-hmm. And so this group then became this very cathartic get together where it was building into each other. And to me, discipling means you use the word of God to build each other up and to grow mm-hmm. people in their depth and understanding mm-hmm. of who God is and what impact he expects us to make in the world. And so, you know, the discipling I do, that's an example outside of work, but you know, it's guys who are all in the business world. Every single person is in the business world there. And so the idea, right, of making disciples is that's a go and make disciples of all the earth. Um, those 12 disciples of his went off and made a lot of disciples mm. over the last 2000 years. And so at work, um, you know, it, uh, I mentor a lot of people at work. And in the context of mentoring, discipleship does come up. That's right. Um, yeah. But I do a lot of kind of outside of work mentoring and discipling in the business community, for sure. Yeah, and it doesn't always have to be called discipleship, right? It's just really walking alongside people, and as you're sharing, I, I think that says discipleship actually happens. Um, now, some of these questions are kind of related to to that. Do you have a life verse? <laughs> Hebrews eleven one, faith okay. is sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. It's on my license plate, in fact. So it reminds right. me every day that. You know, God, you know, that, you know, we tend to believe, we tend to conventional wisdom says seeing is believing. Mm-hmm. I think what God wants us to think about is believing is seeing. Yeah. It, yeah. it just reminds me that, you know what, mm-hmm. I, I can't see God, but I can see God and through people and through things that he communicates to me. So that's my, that's my life verse for mm-hmm. sure. Um, that's great. Um, all right, it, it, there's, there's a couple more coming in, but I think we're only going to take one more here. Uh, this is a good one. Um, hi, Kirk. Do you spend regular time with the Lord? And if so, what does that look like for you? Yeah, so funny. I just I moved this other way earlier, but my <laughs> morning devotional, Jesus Calling. I start out my morning with my daily devotional. Um, you know, I had, I had an MRI today, kind of a checkup, follow-up 
on what I was talking about earlier. And I was in there for an hour and I, uh, I, I told my wife, I said, my back was killing me because I was literally, I couldn't move. And I said, I, I just started praying for people like for an hour. Um, and I find myself during the day when I'm working out or I have moments of breaks where I'll, I'll just pray for people. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I do is, you know, one of the things I learned about God is, you know, I don't use the word religion. Mm -hmm. I use the word relationship. Religion is man-made relationship is God breathed. And, and so I think about my relationship with God and like I do my relationship with my wife, the more time I spend with him, the more mm -hmm. time I talk to him, that's when we grow into a relationship. And it isn't like I hear God audibly, like, like, Hey God, how's it going? And, oh, Kirk. Well, how about you today? son? like, that is not how it goes, <laughs> but I talk to God regularly throughout the day, yeah. whether it's, Hey, I've got a business challenge. I've got a challenge with one of my kids. I've got a challenge with, you know, my wife, or my beers and Bibles group, whatever it is. Like I've got a challenge and thinking about it, you know, and how do I, how do I connect those dots and do what God wants me to do? And I think what I try to do is, is, you know, God is my connective tissue throughout my day. And so how do I make sure that's part of how I orient myself at the beginning of the day? And I know when I don't start here in his word, my day is different, not as good. You know, I find when I do that, starting off my day when my mind is clear and I can focus on him, then it orients me in the right direction versus it being sort of, oh, I'll get to it when I can. And I never do. It's like working. If you don't work out in the morning, you're not going to work out. Right. right? So but mm -hmm. if I don't spend that time with the Lord, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend that time with the Lord that I need to. Good, good. Well, you know, Coach Terry Franson has this last question. This one will be the last one, but I think it'd be good for you to respond to this. If you had to do it all over again with your kids, what would you do different? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's wow. a good one. I, but in fact, it's like less than a minute, right? <laughs> no, okay, less than a minute. No, no, just kidding. So I, um, gosh, you know what? It's, it's interesting. I, I think about this, like what I would do over again. And uh -huh. my answer always comes back to, have you ever seen the movie, The Butterfly Effect, right? It's that idea that one little chain sets off this dramatic chain of events that mm -hmm. forever alters the outcome. It's the, you know, if you're one degree off flying from LA to New York, mm -hmm. you're going to land in Virginia, right? And mm -hmm. over 3, 2,300 miles, whatever it is. And, and so I think about that often because there's so many things I would do different as a parent. Like I was you know, one of the things early on, I was so focused on my work. I wasn't focused on them. I missed so much in my oldest daughter's first six years and my second daughter's first three years mm. that I, you know, I'll, I'll never get that time back, right? The one commodity you can never get back is time. Mm. I, I wish I, I wish I could flip back the clock on that and mm. spend that time when they were younger. Um, I wish I wasn't as impatient. Like I am the most impatient person. I hate that about myself. I have, I have, in my, on my mirror in my bathroom, I have the fruits of the spirit, mm. I have that up there. And, you know, and patience is one of the nine fruits of the spirit. Right. <laughs> and I, I, every day I'm like, God, you know, I, I, God, please don't bring me to my knees and teach me patience, but please teach me patience. Mm. And it's just something, I don't know. I'm just always like, mm, I always want to do the next thing. I always want to move on. And I think I don't always soak in the moments. And I think about my kids mm. and like part of the joy of being a parent is just basking in those moments with your kids. And just soaking in. I was always so, I'm always so intense and so focused on the next thing. I don't always live in the mind. That's probably the biggest thing for me is I wish I would have done that and stop worrying about being so busy and so outcome oriented. Yeah. That's yeah. My yeah. biggest thing that I wish I would have done differently. I think a Gosh, lot Jerry, of... Now I'm going to go to bed thinking about this tonight. So thank you for that question. <laughs> I think <a> lot <laughs> of you for that. That's good. Well, or Kirk, we've come to the end of our time here and, um, it's so good. It's so refreshing to, to be with you and, and thank you everyone for being on the call. And these questions are fantastic. Um, what I'll do uh, for you, Kirk, is to, there's some one, a number of wonderful comments that people have made and I'll forward those to you. Great. And, thank uh, you. But, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for being with us. So appreciate your sharing and your heart for the Lord and just, yeah, this, this wisdom that we're also getting. So, well, thank you for right. us, Dave. And thank yeah, you. Yeah. Us. Great to be with you. All right. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for joining Engage Virtual Edition. We hope you were encouraged and inspired. If you would like to learn more about a faith journey and relationship with God, please email us at info at connect.sv. Get connected. 
join our LinkedIn group and be part of a growing community. Follow us and continue the conversation on Instagram at Connect Silicon Valley. And follow and like us on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were encouraged and inspired to continue conversations about faith and life.